we have a thing that Samaritan called the self determination policy. Mm hmm. And the self determination, in a nutshell, is to say we, we believe that every human being has the right to decide what they do with their life. So if they want to take their life, that's up to them. This will probably get your blood boiling, but there, there's a chance that we could be talking to a paedophile telling us, you know, I've been, I've been doing things with children uh, and I'm really worried and I'm anxious because people are going to start to find out and you're there to support that person. Like, it's the only way you can survive the Samaritans is you have to leave all your biases and all of your all of your opinions and all of your thoughts whichever way you think at the door and that's quite a powerful one because they might sit there and think actually yeah I don't actually want to die I just I just wish things were different and then what you've done is you've opened up a possibility that things might be different yeah. if I got tapped out and everyone started laughing at me and going oh you're shit mate you're, you're terrible yeah. jiu-jitsu never going back I'd never go back right so there's a massive thing. Confidence comes from the people you got around you as well. And, and some of the people callers we get from Samaritans haven't got anyone to give them that confidence. Mm-hmm. So the sleep, nutrition, exercise, okay? If you just get those three right, then 90% of your problems will go away. But it's it, it, because you start getting more self-worth, you feel healthier, you get good endorphins, that sort of thing. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel. Today's guest is a good Samaritan, Jake Phillips. Jake, how are you, mate? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome, mate. Thanks for coming on. Um, so growing up, when I was a kid, like you'd always joke about people helping people out in the street when we're good Samaritan. Yeah. Um, but you're an actual Samaritan. Yeah. So as an organisation, like who are the Samaritans? What do they do? So how much do you know about them, first of all? You- I, I know fuck all, so... Yeah, assume we know nothing. Yeah. Okay, so Samaritans are an org- a charity, a charitable organisation, and they're read, they're run purely with volunteers. And the point of the the charity is to have people listening to people that are going through really tough times, struggling um, mentally. Um, and the goal is to try and reduce uh, suicides in in the UK. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a common misconception. People think that you you purely just ring the service if you're like thinking about killing yourself, but that's not always the case. You know. There's certain things that will happen before you decide to get to that point. So we're there, we're there for that as well. So if you're just feeling low or you're struggling with your mental health or anything like that, then people tend to call the Samaritans. So that's that's essentially what it's there for. Okay. So it is it is primarily focused around suicide. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So it's, it's there to support people that are struggling, mm-hmm. but with, with the aim of preventing suicide. Yeah. yeah. And is it is it for people that are like at crisis points, so they're at the point of suicide, or anybody that they're struggling on any sort of level with mental health, can they get in touch? Yeah, any any level. So um I would it's 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 more it's more rare to get a call where someone is thinking about taking their life or or actively taking their life. Uh, to be fair, more common that people are thinking of taking their life, but a lot of the time people just ring out we have all sorts of different calls. So someone might ring us because they're lonely or someone might ring us because they're like, oh, you know, I've got this feeling um, I just can't explain it, like you know, I'm feeling low all the time and I can't motivate myself to do things. So, yeah, we get all, all different types of calls from, from that perspective. Yeah, okay. And you said it was run you said entirely on volunteers? Yeah, so um, in terms of the actual listening, so okay. we have all, all volunteers. Obviously, we've got a head, head office, I imagine, that do like the admin, admin yeah, okay. bits and run, yeah, yeah. run the charity. Um, but everyone in the in the branches that we're in, they're all volunteers. It's all volunteer-led. Uh, led, and they do all sorts of different jobs as well. So... We've got list majority of us are listeners, right? So we're there on the calls, like taking the calls. Um, but there's lots of different groups in there, as you can imagine, that you'd need to run a branch. So you'd need like a head of IT. You'd need someone that's running the training. You need someone that's running the recruitment. Um, you need someone that's managing the building, like getting all of our free biscuits and stuff from our <laughs> places. Because um, that's how you keep Samaritans going. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, so there's there's like a, a little organization within itself. And then we have like a branch director. Um and then people get nominated for, for different heads of roles. Okay. And in regard to funding, is that is that donations or is it government funded? So it's donations. I don't actually know the, the full the full extent of where we get our funding from. Mm-hmm. Um, I can imagine there'll be some sort of government grants that are going into Samaritans, but... We hear about it a lot, don't you, the Samaritans? You know, it's like an institutional thing, isn't it? So yeah. they must get some sort of fucking help, yeah. you imagine, wouldn't you? Yeah, but like I say, I, I remember hearing them about when I was a kid, and I don't know if it's the word Samaritan, whether that means something. Yeah. But but yeah, you, you, I'm sure you'd even read it in the papers, like someone attacked in the street, yeah, good Samaritan, good Samaritan saved yeah, them. Yeah. It's, in, it's in the Bible. Is it? Okay. Yeah, so... Do you know uh, what the word actually means? So Samaritan is someone... Fr- it was a place, I believe, so oh. I, I'm, I'm going to be fact-checked here. But 
Samaritans is a, is a place of the good Samaritan is someone that was from a place called Samaritan right. in the Bible. Um, and there was like a, I don't know, like a homeless person or someone that was been beaten up on the side of the road. And this person was the one that stopped and helped them. Um, but Samaritans aren't affiliated with any charity, with any um, religion. Okay. Um, so they, 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 they would argue it probably didn't come from the Bible, but yeah, that's, that's where the word comes from. Yeah, okay, right. And and the actual organisation then that you're now part of, how long has that been around for, do you know? 1972 is when it okay. when, when it started by a guy called Chad Vara. Okay, so he, he, he started the charity. Um, and now we've got, I think there's over 200 branches in, in the UK mm. spread around. And I think there's over like 2,500 listeners. Yeah, okay. Um, volunteer listeners. Wow, okay. Um, so there's a lot of us. That's yeah, a lot. About, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you said um, there's a misconception about the fact that people just think it's like a hotline or a phone call. Mm. Are people able to walk in and, and see somebody face to face? Or yeah, yeah. Okay. So this this used to happen a lot. This has never happened to me, right? So before before the pandemic, I think it happened a lot more. Um, but then during the pandemic, it, it just wasn't allowed. Um, but people could just rock up to the branches, knock on the door, and you let them in and sit them down and have a cup of tea with them and have a chat with them. Um, so you, you could do it face to face. You could also get in touch via email as well mm-hmm. if you wanted to. And there's now a chat, an instant chat. Okay. Um, so there's lots of different ways to get yeah. it. It's, um, not, it's not a chat bot, is it? It's not a chat bot. No. <laughs> you that'd imagine be, that. AI chat bot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it'd be a really emotional AI chat bot. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be good. But yeah, so yeah, it's purely human, yeah, human okay. led. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, that's good for now. Um, and we'll, we'll get into the reasons for you joining a little bit later on, but how long have you been part of the Samaritans for now? So I, I joined, I think it was 2022, where are we, 2000. Yeah, so I've been doing it about two years now, yeah. coming up to my second year. Yeah, okay. But some people have been there for like 30 years. Wow, okay. Yeah, the longevity, that, that's one of the things that, that struck me like, massively when I joined it, was some people, like the longevity of people staying there and the retention is is massively high. But what you find is you get a big influx of people that come in and there's normally about 10 people in a, in a training group or 12 people. And then within six months, you might have like four left, yeah. three left. But the ones that do stay, like after the year, tend to go on and do it for years and years and years and years. Yeah. And how, how many night, nights a week do you do it or days a week? Or- so the, the, so we have like expectations. Obviously, everyone's volunteers. They, they have to work around their lives. Um, but I I personally try and do one a week. So it's a three-hour shift um, on the phones. But then I'm also a leader. So I do some shifts from home as well. So um, what that means is you're there as a leader. You're there for the listeners. So at the end of every shift, you have to have this thing called an offload. Because as you can imagine, you're probably listening to a lot of like heavy, yeah, heavy shit. So. And they then need to tell someone how the shift went, what went on. And it's just a, a, an opportunity for them to vent and, and for you to um, just make sure they're okay before they go home. Yeah. Um, and that's what that's there for. And it's, it's almost like quite ceremonious. So like you go in to have a chat with your leader and just say, this is what happened on this call. This is what happened in this call. And then you take your notes and you shred them. And then when you leave, you're almost like, oh, it's just like a weight lifted. You're kind of like, well, I'm done with that now. Mm. And I'll go back to being like a normal human. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And then, you know, for, for when, when you're thinking about joining, um, you know, anybody, um, do you need any particular sort of training or prior experience to join? No, no, no any, anyone can do it. So, um, yeah, you don't have to be like a mental health expert. Um you know, you're vetted in the recruitment process. And I think that's just to make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're okay. And, you know, it's something that you'll better manage. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you're invited along to training and then you, you do your training. Um, and then, yeah, so anyone could do it. So what's the training entail? Like, what do you do for the training? So the training's really good, actually. I, well, I work for a training company. So, like, I was quite impressed by some of the things they were, um, the, the way that they've done it. But you, you go on, like, quite an intensive course. Um, and you, you, it's about, I think it's like four hour days and you turn up on a Sunday morning um, and you do that for about, I think it's like eight or 10 weeks. I can't remember how long the process was. That's before you even got on the phone. So you're just in with a group of people, learn about all of the policies, um, learning how to have a conversation with someone essentially. And then once you pass that part, you then get given a mentor and then you're a uh, beginner Samaritan. So you're you're sat with people listening into their calls, um, and then you, you you know you'll have a go at the calls yourself, and they'll be there to support if, if you need to. Mm-hmm. And once you get past that period, I think you need like X amount of uh, I think it's like six six shifts. You then go into a probationer uh, Samaritan, which basically means you can do the shifts on your own, 
but you have to be with someone that's past their probation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think it's 72 hours that you, you need to do before you lose the probationer title. And then you have to be signed off by your mentor. Mm-hmm. And then you're a full Samaritan. So it takes a while to get to that point. Um, but if you know if you're motivated enough and you do enough shifts and you can get there a little bit quicker, are there any any sort of competency sign-offs throughout that process? Yeah, so I mean, there's uh, there's 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 a massive list of things that you need to be able to do. So you need to be able to signpost people properly. Mm-hmm. You need to um, identify safeguarding issues, and in even even things just like open open, like open questions, not leading people. That's like one of the things I was really wo- luckily I worked, you know, in, in a shithole call center for years. Um, and I was like regulated by the FCA. So I always like, knew how to keep my wits about me on the phone and like, not lead people down certain routes and stuff. So from that aspect, it's not too bad. But you do have to make sure that you're not like anything you say isn't deemed as assisting someone in, in taking their own life or like giving them advice because we're not we're not professionals. None of us are professionals. You know, we're, we're just average people off the street. Um, so we can't, you know, we can't give tell people that. Sometimes it's quite frustrating. Because you be sat there, but you just need to do this, mate. Do you know what I mean? And, and you've got to like, stop yourself from saying that. You've got to ask open questions to get them to look inwardly to, to eventually get there. You just, you just said mate then, is it? Mostly men? Well, we get a mix of lots of different people. I mean, I, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not. I'm no, not, no, I'm I mean, not, just from but, your own your experience. Yeah, I mean, I get a lot I get a lot of female callers, like a lot of female callers. Um, it's, it's interesting, though, because you get like lots of different, I guess... You start to pick up trends of what some some people might might talk to. We get a lot of prisoners, a lot of prisoners from inside prison. It's from inside prison. Yeah. So all prisons are, are set up differently, yeah. but some will have just like constant access to Samaritans, um, and often they they might call you because they're a bit bored, um, and they might want to like take the piss a little bit. Um, uh, sometimes they call because they've got the, you know they've got a genuine issue. Sometimes they're really frustrated about something that's happening to them. You know they're locked up. They've got any freedom. You know. They're, They'll they'll feel aggrieved in some way, so we deal with a lot of that. But yeah, and they tend to be men, but the prisoners. Um, but we do get a lot of female callers as well, and a, lo- a lot of old people as well. A lot of old people. Yeah, and and I think it's because they're lonely. That's what they say, loneliness. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know they often talk to us about their spouses dying and and things like that. And you know I can't go into too much detail about actual calls, but like the themes tend to be a, a, about that, like about their, their spouses dying and how lonely they are. Mm, yeah, it's tough, man. So what does an average shift look like then? You mentioned uh, a second ago about sort of your frequency of work and everything, but I guess in regard to, yeah, the sort of time on shift, the, the call volumes, like who you're working with, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so in any given shift, you're just with two people. So it's just yourself and one other person, unless someone's being trained. So you'll have like three people. Um, if there's... Only one person can make it and the other person can't make it. The shift is cancelled. Um, and the reason why you have an extra person there is, is if anything kicks off and you need to call an ambulance or or anything like that, then you've got someone there to help you um, who you would usually call your leader or, you know, they'll be on the phone to the ambulance while you're talking to the, to the caller. So, yeah, that, that has to happen. There's like certain protocols you have to go through, things like signing, make sure the building's all secure, that sort of thing. Um and then yeah and then then you just crack on with the shift and you, you you're on a dialer have you guys worked in a call center before sadly yes yeah, you have i remember you I've, I've had some amazing stories about you working in a call center actually, <laughs> you've told me. um what about you danny have you worked in no nah, never no nah. so it's there's it's like a dialer so like you you put yourself as available and then it just rings off and then if you don't take yourself off the dialer then it'll ring again so you can just sit there and take call after call after call after call um, and then you log the calls and then you move on or you if you want to take a break you can as well because it's like quite intense especially if, like some calls will be like five minutes some calls will be your whole shift you might be on a call for like two hours um, depending on what's going on so it's not t- time dependent you can no. just stay on the call and just and all of the calls are anonymous and so none of them are recorded um, we don't know who the other person is at the end of the phone we know nothing about them unless they give us their information so it's and, and that's quite an important point to make. Like it, you know, if you're ringing the Samaritans, they have no information on you whatsoever. So you you can be confident that you can share things that you might not want to share with other people, and it's not going anywhere unless you give up that information yourself. We won't know. We won't know who you are. Mm. Yeah, going back to the the call center thing. Um, yeah, I remember that dialer was horrible, yeah. fucking horrendous, mate. But 
obviously in a call center where they're driving, you know, sort of targets and revenue and everything else, there there's restrictions around breaks. I'm assuming that's not the case for for what you no, do. No, no, not at all. You know, there's been, oh, and I'm happy to admit, there's been a couple of times where I've not been in a great place and I've turned up and I've signed up to the shift and I didn't want to let them down. Um, and you know, if you if you're if you're just, oh, I'm not, I really can't speak to people that are like going through it right now. So I'm I'm struggling myself. Like, so you might. And that might just be because you're tired, you've had a really bad day at work or something. So you might just stick on emails for a bit or you might like take a couple of calls and then I'm not really feeling it tonight. Mm-hmm. It's weird. It is a bit like a feeling. Like sometimes you feel like it's going well tonight, you know, and sometimes you feel like you can articulate yourself better. Then I don't know if you guys get that, but sometimes you're like, the words aren't coming out right or, yeah. you know, you're struggling to find the right like questions and stuff. Whereas like other days, you you know, you'll, you'll be smashing it and you're like, yeah, I'm enjoying this. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm helping people. Um, so yeah, it just it just depends on how you turn up sometimes, and and there's no yeah, there's they were you don't you can have as many breaks as you want. And a, another thing that I remember in the call centers as well, which again fucking awful, a big a big banner that had like the amount of calls waiting and the time that they waited for. Have you got any <laughs> yeah, no. like that? We do, we do, do actually do. have that. Like, yeah, yeah. Does that yeah. add any sort of pressure? It to... does a bit. I must admit, it does a little bit because you're sat there and you're thinking, what there's 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 hundreds of people here. That, oh, it's not always hundreds. It's like a big queue might look like 45 people. And bear in mind, that's everyone in the country that's, that's logged in at that time will be picking Taking up those calls. Yeah. yeah. So you'll be sat there looking at it sometimes, thinking I'm doing an email, I'm not chatting to my partner about something. Um, and then you go, well, I should probably start taking more calls now because there's a lot of people waiting. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there is, there, is, there is call queues. There's also email queues as well. So you know roughly how many emails are in the inbox as well. Um, but we keep we keep on top of it. To be fair, we like we, you know, it's it's, it's managed well, yeah. um, and and that's why you you volunteer. You're there to talk to people. You know, that's that's the point. So no one's really turning up and just not doing anything. Yeah, no one's got a gun to your head. They make yeah. you do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's your choice. Yeah. Do you know what the um, maybe just speaking locally, but do you know what the average wait times are to get through to a listener? I don't. Um, it changes though. It's, it's variant. So sometimes people will get in straight away. Um, sometimes people can be waiting for quite some time. Yeah. Just depends on call volumes at the time. I think what Samaritans do well is they identify times where they know it's going to be a little bit uh, busier. So like late late nights on weekends and stuff. You know that tends to be quite bad. With you know we get a lot of like alcoholics and stuff like that. Um, and around Christmas time, you know like the holidays. You know when, when people. You can imagine when people are likely to be sad. Um, so it'd be like, yeah, there's there's all sorts of different times. So when that happens, there might be more. There like there'll be like um, priority shifts. Mm-hmm. So there'll be yeah. like more people in the in the country will have people on at that point um, to make sure that we're we're covering the workload. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And then I guess you kind of touched on it a little bit already, but the actual calls themselves. I know you can't get into specifics. But can you tell us a little bit about the sorts of calls that you get? So, I mean, like, I guess the burning question for me, and it's it's uh, potentially a tough one to answer maybe, but have you had to, like, hear somebody take their own life down the phone? Yeah, yeah, that's that's happened. Um, it ha- yeah, and, and, you know, it's the nature of, of, of the beast. Like, S- Samaritans is there for, for people that are going through a tough time. But, you know, like, like we said at the beginning, it's there to prevent suicide. Um, it's really sad, but like, sometimes people just want to, call you when they're doing it um, and they've made up their mind and they're saying you know I want to take my life um, I'm going to do it now I just don't want to be on my own and can right. you tell them not to do it no so it must be so difficult it's it like is like just being like it is I guess and, and so we have a thing at Samaritan it's called the self-determination policy mm-hmm. and the self-determination in a nutshell is to say we, we believe that every human being has the right to decide what they do with their life so if they want to take their life, that's up to them. You know, we what we're there for is to pose questions to help them realise whether that is what they want to do, whether you know, and help them sort out their their thoughts a little bit. Mm-hmm. There's a really good analogy. He said, um, imagine like a, a washing machine, and you throw loads of like different coloured like clothes in there, and it's spinning around. And when you watch it, it just looks like a mess. It's just like loads of colours just like flying around. And the role of the Samaritans is to turn the washing machine off and just take out each item so we can look at it, like look at it more clearly, fold it up, put it down, look at the next one. And that's like a metaphor for your thoughts. So it's like some of the questions we might ask, for instance, if someone's like, you know, I, I want to take my life up. I've had enough and like, I can't do it anymore. 
um, one of the most powerful questions I might ask is, you know, do you want, do you really want to take your life? Would you just want your situation now to be different? And that's quite a powerful one because they might sit there and think, actually, yeah, I, d- I don't actually want to die. I just, I just fit, wish things were different. And then what you've done is you've opened up a possibility that things might be different or there is, there is another way. And then that can change mindsets. But, you know, someone's really like, you, you think like, it's like, but like, it's going to, it's going to sound really insensitive, but imagine like buying a car, right? You don't just rock up to a, to the sales forecourt these days and go, oh, I need a car. Have you thought about what you want? No. Like nine times out of 10, our, the way our behavior is now is we know kind of what car we want to buy. And then it's just about getting the best price. I, that's the way I see it with Samaritans. Like if if someone's made a decision to to die, then usually they they're they're further down the thought process. They sort of know what they thought about this. They know their brain more than anyone else. So they're coming to you saying, "I've made my decision," you know. And then all you can do is just be there for them in that moment. Like ask them the questions that you'd ask. Make sure that ask them if they want any support do you, do you want us to call an ambulance like you're going to need to give us your details that sort of thing um if they change their mind but yeah and and there's no closure you don't find that because it's anonymous you don't find out what happens so the phone might go dead or like you'll be on the phone for like after they said they're going to take their life and it might be 10 minutes and then that's it it's, yeah you, you can't hear you, can't you don't hear. know who they are where they are no no how do you process that so it's, it's funny, like, so um, I've spoken to you about this, Paul, but like, I learned this recently, actually. So it's, there's, there's like different like levels of like um, empathy. Um, so you've got like emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. And that's the only way I can describe it. So you get some people that like cannot help it. If you tell them something terrible, they're going to feel it and they might cry or they might like take that on board and worry about that person. I'm not really that type of person. Um, I'm more like cognitive. So I understand your situation and I know it's really shit for you, um, but I'm not going to take that on. It's sort of like, I can, there's almost like a, 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 a layer of like, oh, that's a really bad situation for you. I'm sorry that's happening. And then, and then yeah, and then uh, that's the only way I, I, I feel like you can process it. And then we've got the protocols in place where, you know, you can offload at the end. But yeah, it's just, a, you know, it's a fact of life. Like these, these things happen, you know? Yeah. I guess you've got to look at it that way because if you were emotional towards it, Fucking hell, you'd be a mess every time you went into into volunteer, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if it's um, if you are sort of emotionally empathetic, maybe you're not the right sort of person for that type of role. I don't know. Well, yeah, and you know, it's interesting. Some people might be, um, and they might have different coping mechanisms. I can only speak from my perspective, but you know, like it's always interesting. I always find it interesting because since I found that that information, I'm always like, are you? What kind of empathy are you? You're definitely cognitive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're probably the ultimate co- cognitive empathy person I know. Thanks, mate. It's yeah. kind of a compliment, I think, is it? Yeah, it, means think so. it means you're dead inside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's an interesting thing. Um, so with those calls, and again, I uh, appreciate you can't go into specifics, but you know, can you can you think of occasions where someone's called in like on the edge um, and through your questioning and, you know, sort of provoke, sort of provoking a little bit of thought, you've, in that conversation, kind of pulled them back out and, and left them with a, some sort of solution. Can you give us an example of that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if, like, solution's the right the right word. What tends to happen is just, like, I think everyone, if you imagine, like, imagine, like, a kettle boiling over, right? And you're there and you just, and all, all you've done is you've just taken off the heat and it settles down again. Like, that's happened a lot. It's not like you you fix the problem, like th- th- it will boil again when you put it back on the heat. But for now, you just it's a bit of relief, yeah. Um, and I think that's happened countless times. You know, I've had people call and they're they're in tears and they're crying and they're like they can't get their words out and they're sobbing. And if you're patient with them and you just wait and then you you give them as much time and respect and space as you can and just ask them like open questions. So I'm not going anywhere. Like, you know, just when you're ready, just let me know. Like tell me when you're ready and we can speak. And then yeah. You start to get into it and you ask them, ask them questions and they reflect. Some people just need to vent, but some people also need to, I need you to help me make sense of how I'm feeling because I'm, I'm confused. Like that's what a lot, a lot of it is. So yeah, th- that, that happens a lot. That happens a lot. I, I, you know, 
it's fear. A lot of our reactions as humans, in, in my opinion, is fear based. Like we're, we're we're fearful of what's going to happen in our heads, or we're fearful of what's going to happen next. And you're just there to sort of calm them down a little bit, take the fear away a little bit, and say you're not alone. The chances are, if your life's shit, your life's probably going to be shit after you speak to me for ten minutes. Like I'm I'm not going to give you a magic pill that's going to make you feel better. Um, but like if if I can move you from like on the floor to like here, just like off the floor a little bit. Then, I've, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I've done my job in a way because, you know, you, you're probably you've got a little bit more of a chance of being a little bit more logical and calmer in that situation. Yeah, the, the reason I said about um, coming up with solutions is, I guess, from like a, a personal training or, or exercise rehabilitation perspective, you use like motivational interviewing, yeah. which I'd imagine is something that you maybe incorporate a little bit as well, yeah. and that's where you use sort of questions to support somebody in making their own decisions about how they can make positive lifestyle changes. Yeah. Is that the sort of thing you would typically do as well? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's that, that is interesting, really, because I, I often think about you guys in, in terms of like PTs and and how how you get people to motivate to do things, mm. and it's, it's very similar. So would you, would you call it motivational? Motivational interviewing. Interviewing. Yeah. Um, if, you've, if you're not familiar, look it up, mate. You'll find it really yeah, really helpful, yeah. I think. Yeah, and that, that's, do you feel like that's probably the most effective way of getting people to make? Yeah, because you 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 support them in making their own decisions to to make changes. And you know you'll know this as well, but you can you can take a horse to water, right? You can't make it drink. So you have to support people in making their own decisions about things because when they decide they want to change or take action, then they will. If someone else is telling them to do it, it might go so far. I mean, for some people that might work, but I find in my experience, for the most people, they need to they need to decide themselves. Do you yeah. find that? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you can show them everything, but if they if they're not in the right mindset, they're not they're not going to listen. So. And I find that with Samaritans as well. But what, why do you think that? It's, it's, it's strange, isn't it? Because well, people want to be in control, um, and it may be you know, more of a more of a male thing. I don't know, but you know, when guys are down, you know, from from what we've learned doing this podcast and from my own headspace in the past, perhaps, you know, often I am down in the dumps because I, I'm in a situation or a, a scenario that I want to find a solution to. And if someone else tells me what to do, I'd be like, I still feel like a bit of a fucking loser because someone else is still telling me what to do. Whereas if I'm able or facilitated in making my own, create my own solution for the problem, then that just makes me feel a bit better. I don't know if that's something to do with it, perhaps. There's something around here then. I think it's something around discovery, like self-discovery or like you need to understand something before you can do it. Like if you try and explain something that you don't understand, it doesn't come out right. And I think it's, it works the opposite way in, in, in a way. Like it's, it's almost like, I need to make sense of what I need to do before I can I can execute it, but not everyone has those answers like, all of the time, um, and that's where coaching or Samaritans or like counselling or that sort of thing comes in handy because it's like, well, how do I help you discover what you need to do? Yeah, motivation comes and goes all the time, doesn't it? You know, it's something that always changes. But I think in general, if you can try and get your life in order through exercise, fitness, all those types of things, it's it's always like building blocks and it's pillars to making your life more successful. I spoke recently with one of my clients about it and they were like a little bit low and feeling like this. And I'm like, well, just let's just worry about these fundamental pillars that can make your life better, you know, and, and build on that. It's not, you haven't got to make radical changes all the time. And I think that's what people get confused about. They got high amounts of motivation at points. And then when that motivation dies, They've got, they've got nothing. They're like, oh, fuck, my life's shit again, my life's this and that. Whereas if it, they fuck, fuck the motivation off and just try and create like those pillars where every day you're waking up, you, you're doing X, Y, Z, you know, even just go for a walk or eat better, you know, make sure your first two meals of the day, every day are good. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like get into that habit, just making those first two meals every day, your breakfast and your dinner, perfect every day without even thinking about it. Whether your motivation's good or bad or whatever because then tea won't matter as much if you're fucking eating shit for tea then it's not as much of a difference yeah, because you're, you're 60 percent better than you were yesterday exactly yeah, yeah. that's it it's, that's- it's it's those things that i think if people fucked motivation off you know a little bit and just worried about being you know more consistent i think with everything that's massive the consistency thing have you, have you ever seen um the thing on netflix uh stats you ever seen that documentary what's it called stats so it's a, it's a name no. of a, a person it's a weird name like stats no, no, um no, but it. It's Jonah Hills, the the, the uh, comedian, the actor, mm-hmm. is his therapist. Okay, and he's done like a thing on him, and he he talks about this thing in in this documentary called the Life Force, which is like a triangle, right? And at the base of the triangle is um, like nutrition and exercise mm-hmm. and sleep. 
sleep, nutrition, and exercise. Okay. If you just get those three right, then 90% of your problems will go away. But this it, it, because you start getting more self worth, you feel healthy, you get good endorphins, that sort of thing. And we all know this shit, right? But that's that's you know, that's what they say. The next part of the triangle is your relationships. So make sure that you've got friends around you or you're cultivating good relationships with people. You're not isolated. People understand you. You've got someone that you can go to if you're in trouble. And the final thing, the tip of it is um, understanding yourself. So having self-awareness. So to your point, if you're like, I know every time I go and see my friends on a Saturday, I'm going to sink 10 beers. I can't help it. That's just the way I am. That's all I do. Okay, well, if you know that about yourself, don't put yourself in that situation. Do something else, you know. And the more... The more you discover about yourself and the more you know about yourself, you're less likely to do these things. And that's not like, you know, that's not, I'm not saying that that would cure a lot of the problems of the people that we get calling in from Samaritans. It's not as simple as that, but I, I do think it would go a long way in helping. I think so many people are just lost in, in general life, you know. I think there's so many options and so many different things. Yeah. If you strip it all back and just think about, if you look after yourself, you look after your body, your mind follows. If your body feels like shit, your mind feels like shit. You know, you know how you felt when when you drank to when you stopped drinking. How much better do you feel? Do you know what I mean? You wake up better, you're in a better mood, your family benefits, your training benefits, everything. You you know, we we started a podcast, you know, we do all these stuff. But if you were drinking, you know, like you were, you wouldn't be in this position now. You know, you would you would t- you wouldn't do the editing or you wouldn't do those things that you need to do. And it's those those building blocks all the time, isn't it? And it just it's it spirals. But people need people around them to tell them that. That's the other thing as well. Not everyone can realise it themselves. That's why they do need people like to tell them that. And if people become isolated, like the people that might ring up the Samaritans, you know, you say they get a lot of old people that are lonely or this and that. I know so many, especially older people that again, this is just from my own experience, but female older people, when they're lonely, they drink wine. They get depressed, you know, they, they do all these different things and they might end up ringing you, you know, just because they're at that low point where they haven't got anyone around them. They haven't got anyone to tell them, you know, you'll get out of bed. Don't drink two bottles of wine every night. Don't drink this. Don't do that. And then they get to a point where they, they don't see a way out. And then they, then they're calling you. I thought about this recently, actually, and it's funny what you were saying about, um, people feel lost. And like, this is just, I'm just going to posit an idea and it'd be good to get your idea, your, your thoughts on it. But, do you think, like, as a species, we're so far away from what we're meant to be? Like, there's so much more noise now. Even if, like, and I don't know this for a fact, I don't think that there is a study that exists, but it's almost like I feel like people were probably happier in the 50s because there was less shit to do. Mm. And, or there's less, like, social media or pressures. Because you think, like, I'll give you an example. Do you do, you do fantasy football? You probably don't. But do you do fantasy football? Yeah, I used football? to do fantasy So anymore. I looked at it this morning, right? I've got to put my open my phone. I was like, "Fuck!" I was I've been top in my in the four leagues I'm in, buzzing. I looked at it. I was second in one and third in the other, and it ruined my day. I was just like, "Which I, it, which that doesn't actually matter." It doesn't you know matter. What I mean, it doesn't matter. No, no one gives a shit. I'll forget this in 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 twelve months time. I'll forget how I was performing in December of the fantasy football league in 2023. It doesn't matter. Um, there is a line. I mean, we have to pursue things even if they're hard. That's part of being that's a human condition, right? So, but I, f- I just feel like there's so much noise now. We fill our lives with so much things that just make us worry. Yeah. That that's why there's more depression and more mental health issues. Well, I think it's it's the hierarchy of needs, isn't it? So, like food, shelter. Yeah. Like historically, that would have been all that fucking you, all that mattered. Yeah. Whereas that's like almost certainly in the West, it's basically a given. I know some people in the UK are, are sort of struggling financially, but and, and plenty of people are homeless. But you know, sort of largely speaking, you know, most people have a roof over their head. Most people can get food, even if that is a food bank. There, there's still obviously charities that support with that. So that then leaves you to your point, I think, with just almost like shit to make up to worry about. Yeah. And I think we've talked about this before, but social media as well. I mean, you know, we grew up on on council estates. You know, where I grew up was poor as fuck. It was really rough. Mm-hmm. You know, we were. We were out like stone fighting and and you know playing mental games to to entertain ourselves, but like everybody was poor, yeah. like you know sort of you know sort of hearing about people getting stabbed or seeing a burnt out car and you you know on the field or whatever was kind of fairly normal, yeah. and it didn't bother you because like everybody around she was, was all the same. fucking feral, mate. That's yeah. why, isn't it? I say it but, all the time, you know. But even where we grew up in, like you know, in the area of the city, like it was it was. 
like some cities it's on the cusp of nice areas where I grew up if you travel to the next area there's a shithole traveled in the other direction next area was a shithole so like even like within the sort of local proximity it was all shit and there was no social media so I was oblivious to how the other half lived I had no idea that people didn't live like that and it was only like you saw on films of course but that's Hollywood right that's not real um Whereas now, I think if I grew up in that same situation and I had fucking the other half down my down 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 my phone at me all the time, I think that would really impact my sort of perception of my reality. It's almost like ignorance is bliss. Right? Absolutely. But again, it's so much easier though, isn't it? Like you talk about how we how you were as a kid out outdoors playing. You think the generations that are going through now they're not outdoors playing. They're sat in playing their Xbox. Yeah. They're they're worried about you know mental health they they talk about mental health with kids from such a young age at school you know even last night little example is my lad he uh he was what doing the uh watching the new Fortnite fucking event thing eminem had a Fortnite event right so he played like a live thing or him and all his mates are all fucking there they're all listening to it so kirstie shouts up and says jack stream it so we can watch it downstairs right do you know what's first thing he said he said boys do i have your permission um to stream uh so like you you're happy for my my mum to watch and i was like listening like no fucking way did you just say that you know that's that's the generation they come from he's he he's making sure that his friends are mentally okay with them streaming like him streaming with them in it which I, it just blew my mind straight away because me back ever i wouldn't give a fuck about that would you you'd never even think about it would you well and i they, didn't have yeah, internet page, <laughs> no, so. but, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but you yeah. know what i mean that that sort of scenario where he is way more thoughtful and i always think is it a good or a bad thing is it a good or a bad thing that he's way more thoughtful because it is a good thing but at, at the same time it's giving those uh thought-provoking ideas and and maybe questioning yourself too much oh am i okay am i not okay am I, you know what i mean Ra- rather than going back to what you said if <laughs> Back in the day when you were just fucking surviving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You were you were just doing what you were doing. You know, you were trying to survive. Whereas now it's like everything is is so emotionally connected. Everything that we do is so emotionally connected. You know, we're always worrying, are we okay? You know, at the end of the day, sometimes, do, do we give a fuck? Sometimes you just got to get on with stuff. Yeah. You know, you just got to kind of get that primal instinct back. And again, I can't talk for women, but I'm a, as a man, I always feel like you've got to try and try and uh try and push forward if you're in a really shit shit situation just look at that situation like what you do and and look at it you know unfold your thoughts you know and and look at it and think how can i improve that if you're never willing to improve it then then you're going to be stuck at and then you're going to go down the rabbit hole and and get to that point yeah but it's it's a funny one though isn't it because we had a guest recently the uh, george from the tin men and he was talking a lot about obviously some of the societal responsibilities as well about you know sort of how it was it was more of a gender conversation, but I think you know on both sides of the fence, you know there, there's certain situations that people find themselves in, you know sort of obviously, you know financial is a big one, and I, I want to come on to trends in a second that you see because, you know Nuffield Health did a survey, I think earlier in the year where they I think it was about eight thousand people asked what was what was having the biggest negative impact on their mental health, and at that time it was finance. Um, people were just feeling the pinch from from the, the sort of financial crisis. Um, we've had other guests as well who, who talked about the fact that you know we've touched on it already, but you know that that sort of some men certainly, which is primarily our audience, you know, sort of don't have value, um, and they they're lonely because they can't find intimate partners or whatever. So there's yeah, I think a number of things that seem to have an impact. Do you know with the financing that you're just saying then? Do you think if everyone had their basic financial needs met, the world would be a better place? That's a question. Isn't it? I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking, like, if everyone, say, I said to you, Paul, you're going to have, I don't know, every person in the UK got, I don't know, the way it is now, £1,500 a month. Every single person. Do you think that depression would go up or down? I think we'd find new problems. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I think it would create more problems. Yeah. yeah. I think it probably would. And I think, well, so, so, first of all, there's a lot to be said to, for, for striving to, to do something. And, you know, if you take that away from someone, you could say that that could have a bad effect. Would you still work? Um, I I would, but perhaps many won't. I mean, many don't. But to that question as well, I think, you know, again, growing up where I grew up, everybody was skim, right? It was one of the most deprived areas in the country at the time. But people still had TVs. People still had cars. So, like, poverty in the UK is not the same as poverty in Thailand or in in India. Of course not. And, And I think... 
yeah, if yeah, like to your point about finding new problems, I think if people had their basic needs met, mm. they would still feel they need a new car or, or yeah. need something else, and that would then create the same levels of anxiety around it. Perhaps you can be you can be poor now and have an iPhone. Yeah, and and, and I think that's that's the levels we're talking about now. Yeah. And I think with social social media is a massive one, Dan, like you said before, because for me, social media is like. It's, it, again, it's another. It's a win that we we're we're we're, we're social we're social animals. Humans, like we have we have to. It's very important for us for survival to be liked, because if you take it back to like caveman time, if you weren't liked, you'd probably die because no one would give you their meat or their warmth or anything. Okay, so it's in us to be liked, and we have to be liked. So when you're now put on, imagine being, we had to do that when we were younger with like a handful of kids in our street. Yeah. People have to do that on a mass scale now, you know. If you're not TikTok famous by the time you're 12, are you a piece of shit? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I don't know what's going through their heads now, but the pressures are different to what we had. There's a bigger audience, I think. Have you ever watched Black Mirror? Yeah, I've seen... Have um, you watched Black Mirror? Yeah, I can it's fucking a great TV show. There's an episode, though, where people wear their... Um, I think it's either their likes or their followers, but basically yeah, their social yeah, media yeah. states on their head. And oh, that one's a weird one. Yeah, I yeah, know it's the one you're on yeah, about. Yeah. yeah, and it, like, depending on what where you're at that will like is basically like paywalls or whether state. you can get a house and stuff yeah. in certain areas yeah, yeah. where you had to be yeah that was it that was yeah, really, really interesting. interesting and if you piss people off you they would like just fucking put your social thing down <laughs> so like yeah, you had to be yeah, really yeah. fake and really nice to yeah. everyone so someone was saying that this is happening in China to some that is happening in China yeah, yeah. so you've got a social credit now have you seen this yeah. so yeah so, if, yeah. If you, if you like break the law like jaywalk they can catch you and then your social camera. credit will come yeah so, so social credit that that episode is what? happening in China. So what, what do you mean by social credit? So that's it. So you get like a social credit. So like you said, if you're caught breaking the law, yeah. they'll demote you, they'll take credits off you. And then if you do good stuff, you get better stuff. You know, if you're if you're paying your bills and you're, you know, being a good Samaritan and you're doing all these different things, it will go up. But if you're a piece of shit, then your social credit goes down. But anyone can access your, access your social credit. That's, that's interesting though, because I, I've often thought that like, Obviously, when you do anything wrong, mm-hmm. of course, speeding again recently, fine, <laughs> bosh, every time. They always sting yeah. you in the pocket. So, and I can remember thinking, and maybe not with the, the, the driving is probably a bad example because they do give you points and you will use, lose your license. But I don't know, parking fines, right? Like I was trying to get in town yesterday to buy some Christmas shopping. Couldn't park anywhere in Plymouth. It's a fucking nightmare. So I just gave up. But I was thinking, if I was minted, I could just park in it the same yeah. way. Be an absolute prick and just pay the hundred pound fine. But that's what John yeah. Terry used to do. He used to just yeah. park in disabled base, but it's closer. And I, I, it's, you know, I, can, I can afford the parking. Yeah, he, he was worse. Right. Mario Balotelli, mate. Yeah, when he he was an absolute fucking prick, and he when he signed for City, he would park everywhere in Manchester. Yeah. Like he would just park by the mall. Like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 he'd just he'd literally yeah. leave it there, get a ticket, whatever. Fuck it, boom. Yeah. So I think that's interesting because that like the, the system we've got like in the UK and in most Western countries, again, where it stings you in the pocket. It obviously allows, depending on your, your wealth, to basically yeah, well, do something. To be, a, to be a prick. Whereas yes. that, the social, social, that's different because even if you're wealthy- it's scary though. That's scary because- yeah, It's an interesting that's, concept. That's I like it. You like it, do you? Yeah, so that's that's interesting. I think at, at some point though, where China, <laughs> where China are though, if they, if, we, if they get rid of currency, so there's no money, and then they got social- you know, gradings effectively, you you're fucked. If yeah. if you 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 can't do anything without them knowing, and you can't, you know, it's a good and a bad thing. Obviously, if you are just going to work and paying your bills and and getting on with your life, that's great. But you are definitely then so controlled. You're there, there's no freedom for you to to do anything wrong because you would be scared to walk across the road in the wrong yeah, place, yeah, yeah. or you would be scared to piss in the road if you're if you're hammered on a night out. You know what I mean? <laughs> or you'd be hammered in the first place. <laughs> or just place. fucking do something silly. And I'm not talking about big criminals, because if they're, they're you know, doing shit things, then yeah, they fucking deserve to get, a, you know, t- some reprimand. But <laughs> well, it's, it's actually <laughs> you know makes, I mean? it's, you've got to think about the consequences of this, right? Because that's the important bit. So it, it makes a prisoner of everyone. Because if you have a bad social credit, what they're saying is, you may not be able to apply for certain loans that other people have access to. You may not be you able may, to get certain jobs. You may not be able to get certain jobs. You might, like, and your social credit will be like, you know, if you want to go and buy a, a microwave on finance, yeah. you might get turned down because your social credit's bad. You, you, you know, financial credit's great, but your social credit's bad. But again, it could come back to Black Mirror because it could be that you can't get a certain job anymore because you're, you might be a fucking doctor, but your social credit's shit. But you can only be a doctor if you've got certain social credit. Well, then that affects you where you would live. Because if you can only get a certain job, 
then you can't live where you should live. Does that make sense? So in a roundabout way, that Black Mirror episode is bang on. It, they may not stop you directly from owning that house, but they are indirectly stopping you from owning that house, yeah. Yeah. you know? And that's fucking scary, mm, you know? Yeah, that's fair. I think so many of those fucking episodes are so like, so incredibly accurate to things that you're now starting to see. Like around right, the, the fucking augmented glasses, mate, get me. Do you, know, you ever watch, the, you know, the, the, one of the first three episodes yeah, where he's mate, like he, when he goes yeah. back and he sees matey shagging his missus yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. You imagine, fuck me, that, that, yeah. That there, that's not too far away though, because these glasses that they're bringing out, the the new Meta glasses, yeah. are like fucking. They're hell, just like, giving them ideas, isn't they? Yeah. That's what Black Mirror is just like. That's it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but even like the, you've seen the AI, the the robot dogs they've got in in America now, in New oh, York. Mate, they look exactly the same as from that fucking. Oh no, show that fucking well. black and white one. Yeah, that, that was fucking killing everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Down, yeah. Oh, yeah that, 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 that is that is, that is terrifying. Yeah, it's mad. But anyway, we digress a little bit. Um, I did want to ask about the actual trends and we've kind of covered some of them already but i mean like what are the reasons then that you typically when you when you when you get on the phone with somebody and they say they're going to kill themselves um and you ask that question you know do you really want to die or is it just your situation and they say actually yeah it's my situation yeah. and i assume your next question okay well tell me about your situation yeah, yeah. and they'll tell you about the real pain point like, what do you typically see or hear like, what are the trends so there's a whole you know it's like life's so complex man there's like there's hundreds of things um, and, I, and I can honestly say there's not one thing that, that like is more prominent than the other. Finance is a big thing, I guess. Um, a lot of um, PTSD, um, like traumas. People just cannot get over something that's happened to them. Um, that's In fact, that's probably huge. I, I take back what I said. It probably is one of the, the leading factors because that covers off a lot of ground, right? So it might have been something, they might have been abused or, you know, they might have seen something that's terrible. They might have been, a, you know, a veteran. Um, so that tends to be massive. Um, losing other people, is, and I guess that's a form of PTSD in a way. Like, yeah, definitely. If they if they've lost their like grandfather or like their or brother, child or yeah, something, or yeah. a child, that's that really struggle. They really struggle with that. And and people that are going through abuse currently, like that that happens as well. Like, you know, sometimes. They don't see a way out, and they think that's that's the only way they can get out of their situation. Yeah, it's a tough one, mate. And do you find that um, addiction plays a, a role? I don't know if you can really tell, but I mean, do you do you feel that a lot of the people that are maybe at a real crisis point that you speak to are maybe self medicating through sort of um, alcohol and and substance abuse? I think al so. Alcohol for me is like that's a whole topic on itself. I just I think it's like one of the most harmful substances on, on the planet, really. Um, I think it's the most, yeah. in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, and you, you, might, you might want to clear up what you're drinking over there. Oh yeah, so yeah. that is non-alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do drink. You know, I still drink. I'm on a journey myself. I haven't completely stopped drinking, but I do understand the dangers of it. And you know, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to share. Like, I'll, my my mum's like an alcoholic, and she's she's going through a really really tough time at the moment. Um, and it's hard to watch because when you know someone like that, and you know the capability they've got. They've got the capacity, but there's there's something in the way that's just never going to let them. It's like they're just like they've got like you know it's like they've got them in a stranglehold and they're not letting them go. Mm -hmm. And the, whenever I I think about alcohol, whenever I think about addiction, I think about people that are telling me I think, wow, your your problems are hard, but your you know your way out is harder. Like it's almost like they're standing at the bottom of a mountain and looking up, and they they've just you know they've rocked up in some baldy shorts and that. that. <laughs> Right, let's go. It's like it's, it's like some people need just first of all get equipped to deal with that mountain, and once you're equipped, then you can go take it on. And the only way you can be equipped is if you're kicking those addictions, mm. um, because if you're going to try and do it with that, it's it's going to be way harder. You just can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. I mean, I've obviously found sobriety recently with drinking, and I wouldn't say that I was that level of drinker. Um, I'm not even sure I'd necessarily call myself an alcoholic, but I definitely had some poor behaviours associated with alcohol, and in the last year of not drinking. Um, you know, I'm now at a point, I was just talking about it last night actually, where I just, yeah, I don't think I'd ever go back to it now yeah. because I look back at some of the, um, some of the occasions that I've kind of ruined or even like just flattened the memories of because I was fucking pissed. Some of the decisions and the actions that I've done in the past purely because I was drunk and I found myself in a position now where I never feel like I'm going to do, I, I definitely will, but like I've got complete control over my decisions and my actions, whereas in the past, I didn't feel like that was the case because if I was pissed up, there might be an occasion where I have a bit too much to drink and do or say something stupid. 
that I would later regret or wouldn't normally say in the usual circumstances. And I know that that's just never going to be, a, that's never going to, that's never a danger anymore because of not drinking. It's funny because we, we'll go back to the control thing mm. again. It's like being in control of yourself and make, being able to make decisions for yourself. Yeah. And, and alcohol takes that away, right? And yeah. it's, it's weird because, like, you know, I, I, uh, you know I've, I've, I've spoken to you a lot about alcohol before and I always feel fucking awful after I've drank and I know it's bad for me. I still drink. So the question is, like, why do we do these things still? Like, why, why do we, despite knowing what's good for us and what's bad for us, why do we continue to do the things that's bad for us? And because at, at times it's fun. That's the, yeah. that's the big underlying factor, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. fun. When you go out on the piss or when you're drinking and you get that little buzz and you're having fun and you're with your mates or whatever the situation is, that's, that's fucking fun. But it's the fallout of that. And then people get addicted to that feeling. That's all it is. It's they're addicted to that feeling, isn't it? Yeah, there's a, a bit of reason. I think there's that and there's also a bit of escapism as well. And we talked about this previously where if you are in a situation, um, you know, and, it, and again, it's relative, right? It's, it's definitely a Western problem where people, you know, have a house and they have a family, but they're just fucking bored and they, yeah. they don't see any, any progression. You know, they're stagnating in their life and... They use drinking as a way just to, to kind of, like you say, get a buzz and just escape that at the end of every week. And that, again, another thing that I think about is uh, for years, I, I kind of, I, f I see that as a system of control now, and going back to the being in control thing. But I think if you drink every weekend, it just ends up, you just end up like in this cycle of, of just being stagnant because yeah. you never really kind of kick on. And yeah, and, and I think a lot of that is, a lot of that is, um, culture led as well like yeah. you grow up we grew up in a country where drinking was mandatory almost yeah. like, do you know what I mean you got to a, like 14 15 years old you're, like, you're done the park drinking yeah, yeah you're yeah. drinking I was, you know what i mean I and you know and and you know i'm and i'm not putting blame on anyone but like, i'd be in the pub with my dad at like 15 16 and my dad come from a culture of drinking you know he's a big drinker and we we and we'd go out together and it's almost like they attached it to masculinity in a way, when you're a man and you're growing up and you've got to drink, or oh, you don't drink, well, what's wrong with you? Everyone done it. Yeah. That's the only thing I'd say. When I was at school, everyone who was in, in our group of friends, I don't know about yours, but everyone from about 14, 15, we would go out, we would try and get a bottle of vodka, we would get pissed, too pissed, couldn't handle it, sick everywhere. Do you know what I mean? But we, we'd done that the whole way through probably year t years 10 and 11, going into sixth form and then you can go out and drink. But I was going downtown at 16. Yeah. You know, I was going... Out, out at 16. They didn't you know? care either, did they? Like no, when, when, when we were 16, they just, you know, they, I'm similar age to you, and yeah. you, know, you take my brother's ID or something, and they're like, you yeah. like, they didn't give a shit. So most places didn't even fucking ID. Like, <laughs> they just didn't even care. Yeah. It's so true, though. I, I, yeah, I, I was exactly the same. I remember my first drinking experience, I think I was 14. Did the same thing. We hang around the local corner shop. And we just... Uh, Sass people, aren't you? Yeah. 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 Be like, someone yeah, get, mate, mate. Yeah, so, so get a bottle of vodka, mate. I think the first time I ever got really... Well, the first time I pretty much got drunk, we got vodka and white lightning. Oh. It was a like really cheap cider for those that are in the drink, UK. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I can remember I was I was passing like, the vodka around to my mates and they didn't like the taste of it. So I was like, I'll drink it. But I didn't like the taste of it either. So I used white lightning to flavour the vodka as a mixer. Oh, lovely. And yeah, nice I, cocktail. Yeah, that lasted about 20 minutes and I woke up the next day in a fucking mess. Yeah, no, I was the same parallel. Yeah. I, I went and bought a big bottle of vodka. A mate, he came out and he bought the black label. You know, like the actual Smirnoff with the black label stuff? Yeah, okay, good stuff. What yeah. that, we had that straight. We walked <laughs> down the park. We just started like downing it and I was just paralytic. Like that, yeah. Absolutely paralytic. And I was like crying, going, don't take me home to my mum. Yeah. <laughs> Sat down with my mates, was sick everywhere. Oh. I woke up in the morning, mate's mum was just fucking giving me shit. I was yeah. like, I'm so sorry. Like, do you know what I mean? But I think everyone has those sorts of experiences, don't they? But how, how, do, how do we like, <laughs> yeah. But how do, how do we move, how do we change that? Has that changed? I, I, feel, feel, like, I feel like it has, yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you that question actually, because you guys both work in gyms, right? And just as a football coach, like when I was coaching um, like 20 year olds and stuff, I was kind of like noticing that a lot of these lads tend to prefer to just go to the gym. And, and like, they're, they're, like fitness is almost like a, and I, I, I don't know why that is the case. I don't know whether it's because we've got more information on nutrition and fitness and people take more of an interest or social media. Social media. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I've got to be the biggest person in there's, my class. There's twofold there, right? I think with, with social media and drinking. Um, so the first one is obviously aesthetic and looking a certain way. And I think that creates a whole new problem with like steroids and stuff with like teenagers mm -hmm. taking that and the fucking damage they're doing to their hormones there is unbelievable. That's another story. And I think the other thing, and this is a question for both of you, and thinking back to the states that I used to get in back when I was out on the piss, I just explain one 
if I knew there was a risk of me being a, t- a viral TikTok in that state, oh, yeah. would you have got in that state? Because I fucking would not have done it. And I think that's it. So I think it's it's both looking good on social media, but also not looking bad on social media because some fuckers snapped you on their phone, pissed off, and now it's everywhere. We hear people talking about like brands and shit, and you're like, you're just, you know, you're John from fucking Alamein Road. Like, what are you want to yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like, well, no, I need to feel like, like, worry. Like, it's like a reputation of rep, like, with, like you know, it's South Central. Crazy, it's weird. It? It's crazy. Like, yeah. uh, even with football, you, you see like some old mates that are still playing, and some of the 20 year olds, like you said, in those teams, if they go out, for, they, if they go out for a piss up, those twenty year olds are not there. It's it's us old fuckers, you know what I mean, that are there. But they, they just don't they just don't get involved in it, which is which is mad. We we were like, how how are you not going out on the piss? How are you not going at twenty three to fucking Malia for a week? How are you not going Magaluf? How are you not doing this stuff? And they just have no interest. Like when we were younger, you wanted to be hanging around with the older lot as well. It was, it was weird. Like it's it kind of like I wanted to be a part of that. Like yeah. it was like a cool thing. We used to get fucking ruined, mate. Yeah. Like by the older lads. It, it, someone who's like my age to, to the younger lads, they yeah. would fucking ruin us, mate. Yeah. They'd get pissed. They they fucking yeah. do you know what I mean? It's just crazy. Just fucking ruin us. Whereas that just doesn't happen. It, doesn't it can't happen. happen now because even the club won't allow it. Do you know what I mean? Safeguarding like, issues. Safeguarding. Yeah. yeah. Um, so PTSD, drinking, uh, finance. Are there any other things that you tend to see um, coming up on a regular basis? Yeah, like just we could take them all off, mate. You know, like things like um, domestic abuse. Um, we, we we have people. So we have people, and these are the tougher ones, right? People ring us and say, "I don't know why I feel this way. There's nothing in my life that I consider bad. I just feel this way." And then we, like, you have to dig deep to try and find out what's going on with these people. So sometimes one of the problems is nothing. Like, and this is another thing. Is is I think this is around purpose, um, and. It's one of the hardest things in life, right? Is trying to figure out what... And with all the noise we were talking about nowadays, it's very difficult to find out why we're on the planet. And a lot of that, you know, I'm not a religious person, but there's a, there's a, there's a big, like, a void of... of, of, of like, there's more and more atheists now. And it's like, well, what are people believe? There's not... Well, you're on your own now. Do you know what I mean? If you haven't got a purpose in life, you, it's like, well, it's okay because you know, God God will show me the way. Or you've got your religion. Do you know what I mean? Faith. You don't have that anymore. You don't have your faith anymore. Like so, as a society, a lot of people are becoming more and more lost. So sometimes the problem could be nothing. It's just I don't know why I feel this way, and yeah. it's probably down to you. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah, that's, in an, in, that's an interesting one. There's um, there's something that I do with um, with the joint pain program that I deliver. Um, I think it's called the Life Value Questionnaire, yeah. and it's it's a list of um, different things. So it's like uh, self-care, uh, work, uh, relationships, um, like intimate relationships, uh, sort of physical activity. There's a number of different things, about 10 things, um, zero to 10. And you basically work, the exercise that we ask them to do is you work your way down that list and you literally number everything on how valuable it is to you in your life. Yeah. Scale of one to 10, go down the list and then you go, right, any that are under five, you just get rid of them. And then the ones that are over five, pick three. And that's, that, that's what your values are. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's you as a person. That's what you value the most. And then what we ask them to do is think about maybe creating an intention for every one of those values. So I don't know, like a relationship is a really easy example to use. So um, they might say, because of my joint pain and my, how busy I am, I don't, I'm not intimate with my partner anymore. Um, okay, fine. So uh, an intention might be that you get closer to your partner. And then once you create that intention, you then set three or four goals that you can commit to that will edge you closer to that intention. So that might be right. So I'm going to have a conversation with my partner about the fact that we're not intimate anymore. Um, I'm then going to arrange some childcare and then I'm going to arrange for or, or book a night out. And every month we're going to go out and that's the commitment, that's the intention for that particular value. And you use that to build purpose. So the value, So the value is... What's the value here? It's so, our, that, our, so that was a relationship, like a, it's a relationship, relationship with your about, partner. Yeah, yeah, relationship with your partner. Yeah. So we, we use that to try and create a bit of purpose for people because yeah. I think you're right, and we've talked about this loads with yeah, guests, right? right? I think people that lack purpose, certainly men, it, it fucks with them. Yeah, because they feel used to it. You know, it. everyone we speak to, it always circles back. Yeah. It always circles back to the same fucking problems. It's always purpose. It's always health and fitness, relationships. And just, yeah, purpose. It always comes back to purpose. Have you ever have you ever read um, any of Simon Sinek's books? I've not read the books, but I've seen a lot of his TED talks and his, so, his speeches. I'm a big fan. The Start with Why book, mm. and then um, 
there's a book, there's a second book, there's, there's the follow-up is to find your why. And essentially what the method is, is to speak to someone like we are now and just ask them open questions, things like, you know, what's the proudest you've ever felt? Uh, what would explain that time to me? What, what, what was the time that you felt really, really bad about yourself? Or what was your, you know, what's your favourite thing to do, like, ever? Like, out of all the things you do, what's your favourite? And then you just ask all of these questions. And the, 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 the idea of the partner is to find the links. And, and it's quite revealing. I've done this, this exercise with a few people on my team. And you start to get a really good picture of people. And you go, okay, I think I know what lights you up now. I think I know why you feel like you're on this planet and what, what you know what what it is you want to do. Mm. I mean, it's so powerful. And once people know that about themselves, they feel liberated. They're like, yeah. So so now I can start to aim the tasks I get involved with, the projects I get involved with, at the things that I love to do. And then if you spend more time doing the things you like to do, the chances are you're probably going to be happier. So I'll definitely yeah check that out. That's really mm. that's really cool. Yeah, definitely. And then you also mentioned about um, domestic violence as well. And um, it's, you know, just to touch on that briefly, because I know it's a delicate subject, but again, going back to previous deaths, so uh, I guess uh, George uh, from the Tin Men, domestic violence come up in that. And quite controversially, he was talking about the fact that if you look at abuse, domestic abuse, then that's, you know, sort of on a, on a larger scale, it's fairly kind of even mm -hmm. uh, between the genders. Do you tend to see a uh, sort of trend, whether it's males or females, that get in touch regarding the domestic stuff? I would say females, but oh, okay. I, I think I think the reason for that is because it's more obvious, mm. um, and men probably don't identify or, or are a or easily able to identify when they're being abused, mm. so they may not attribute their problems to that. Mm. Some are. Some people were quite in tune with that because it's subtle, yeah. and 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 just just a disclaimer: these views are my own. Mm. Um, but we have to. So there's a couple of things we need to accept, right? Men are different to women, right? And in in the sense that biologically men are bigger um they're more aggressive and you know abuse might turn up more more commonly as as, as physical violence in in with men but with females they're smaller and they're not as aggressive but that might become more emotional abuse or like mental mental abuse so which is probably a little bit more subtle to detect and so and, and we, we grow when we grow up we don't learn we don't learn the signs of mental abuse at school you know if someone thumped you though you're like, fucking hell, that ain't good. Because I got told off for that when I punched someone at school or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Whereas you don't you don't get pulled into the, well, you never used to, you never get pulled into the headmaster's office for emotionally abusing someone. Or like, tea, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I think I can believe, I can believe that, you know. Yeah. And, and But it's it probably doesn't show up as much, at least from my perspective, from what I've seen, it probably doesn't show up as much just because people don't know if they're being abused yeah it's interesting he talked about soft like sort of hard and soft power yeah. um, and like you know hard power was you know when you're actually in a position of power yeah. um, but soft power was like you know one of the examples he used was the ability to turn like a child against a parent yeah. and that sort of manipulation and that, that as you say really subtle abuse which is um, really hard to kind of detect and yeah. measure I bet you most blocks don't even know what's happening no <laughs> it's true isn't it it's, it's most people probably just don't even know it's happening it's psychological warfare man like you've heard it all before like oh I can't, can't come out tonight the missus has been moaning at me or whatever <laughs> but if you, if you actually like yeah, got under that. the skin of that I'm yeah. like what is she doing this a lot mate like do, do you know what I mean and like yeah. it's like well I've noticed that out of the last 10 times I've asked you to come out 9 times out of the 10 you said that your missus has said no like and you know, you've got to give and take in relationships. I think there are men out there and there's, there's quite a few of us that probably are selfish mm. and um, and do what they want. And if you're in a relationship, you've got to give, you've and got take, to give yeah, and 100%. take, right? But most people's reaction to that, if one of my mates says, oh, I'm not oh. great, missing that, I'll say, fuck off, you pussy. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fucking get out. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Mm. You go, no, no, I can't. And then that's the end of it. But yeah. in my head, I'm thinking, fuck off, mate. Like, yeah. But if it was the other way, it would be, way, it'd be yeah. controlling, wouldn't it? Well, it's, that's it's, it. It's, it's, it's very different. Yeah, it's mm. completely different. It, you never imagine, like, if I was to say that to Cassie, you're not going out with your friends. She'd be like, well, you're right. And then she would say to her friends, oh, no, he's not letting me out. That's a completely different that's conversation, isn't it? Well, what do you mean he's not letting you out? You know, what, does he do it a lot? Yeah. You know, that's abuse. You know, yeah. but, it, but it, the other way, it's completely fine. Yeah. And, it's the, and, I, and I've been lucky that she, like, she's never been like that with me and I've never been like that with her. Yeah. If she wants to go out with her friends, if I want to go out with my friends, you know, we are pretty 
you know, we've always been real down the line with that. But I've definitely had friends who said to me, nah, I'm not coming out because, you know, off. yeah, they're going to kick off. Nah, I can't, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah you, you've dreamed about it all, haven't we? We love like, fucking man down, he's married off again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen yeah. for six months yeah, that's now. It, yeah. But you think, it's, it's crazy to think. I, I think, like, you strike me as a, a good communicator, Danny. I mean, you have a podcast, so it makes yeah. sense. But, like, <laughs> I think that's important, right? That's the most important thing. And it, it, and it, it doesn't come naturally to some people, but I'm very lucky with my wife. Like we're, we're really good at talking. Mm-hmm. Um, and she wouldn't dream of telling me I can't go out. But if I knew it wasn't appropriate to go out, I wouldn't. That's and, the difference. I, yeah. I'm exactly the same. I will never take the piss. And a lot of the times I won't put her in an awkward position. If When I was young, young, when I was in my early 20s, I, I did used to like you know, before Jack was born, I would say to her, oh yeah, we'll go and do something on Saturday. Saturday we come and I want to go out on the piss and I'll just fucking do her over. And she used to, she used to kick off at me, but that's, that's a very different thing yeah, because I have agreed that we were going to do something. Then I've just fucking abandoned her and gone out with my mates, yeah. which is understandable. But as you get older, you understand that, you know, if you want a happy relationship, it's got to be both ways. You've got, got respect. You've got to respect and yeah. it's got to be, you know, if I say to her, yeah, I'm going to stay in Saturday, I'll fucking stay in Saturday. If yeah. Paul invites me out and it, I've got enough time, I'll be, yeah, I'm going out. And it, that that's that's how it should be. And, yeah. then, and there's those lines between that that you've got definitely got to, like, see where they're at. And this this is why our callers call into Samaritans, right? Because they, like, talking is our way, our, our, our method of sorting things out. I think you can and, talk yourself into to where you need to be yeah you can talk if you actually talk it out like you said yeah talk it out and just think about it talk it out because sometimes like you said it's a washing machine it's all, uh, yeah, all yeah. even with myself you know sometimes even doing this podcast now we're talking about things and you know there's there's problems everyone has in life and you feel better after yeah. just even just talking about things that maybe not are not even affecting me quite yeah, as much yeah. at the moment but just talking about them you think ah actually you know, my life's not too bad. Yeah. You know, fucking this is not too bad. That's not too bad, you know? Yeah. It's a strategic tool, isn't it? Like, that's what that's what language is. Mm. So, what you use it to, to make battle plans, really, or you use it to influence, or you use it... So, that's that's why talking feels good. Like, when, when, you, when you talk to someone about your problems, you're like, well, I'm getting stuff done. I wonder if, like, talking your problems out gives you dopamine because you feel like you're, you're achieving, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a superpower, isn't it? If someone's a really good communicator... Like we was talking about this in the car today, actually. Um, my son, as he was talking and me doing this podcast, when I first started, I would um, um, um all the time and things like that. And we talked about this, didn't we? And then you watch people who do not um or do not say literally or basically or any of that sort of stuff. My son was in the back seat today and he was trying to get this story out, but he was going, oh, basically and uh, uh, uh. And he's a really clever lad. And I said to Kirsty, I said, we should get him some lessons or something yeah. early because people are a lot more authoritative if they can talk well. If they can get their, if, if what they got in their head can can come out in the right way every single time that, and the way they mean it, that's that's so powerful. That's more powerful than anything else because it demands a certain amount of respect, you know, because they can they can do that. Yeah, I, I'm the same as you, mate. I, 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 you know, I admire people that can be really concise, mm. but also just like get to the substance of what they're talking about. Like really, how many how many uneducated people that come from really poor, deprived areas who've had drug abuse, alcohol abuse maybe can't even explain yeah to the extent of how they're feeling mm. there's probably so many people like that that yeah. can't actually explain this is my actual issue because they probably don't know how to explain it that's a really good point it's like it's hamstringing them like they can't yeah, yeah. they can't just get out how they how they feel and how they can ever get better yeah definitely and one of the other things that came out of the episode with the tin men as well was around um talking about men's suicide rates and he attributed about 20 percent to um, access to children so where men are unable to see their kids because of a separation and and custody issues which is obviously heavily weighted towards females um, in in most i think countries do you tend to find that that's something that comes up at all uh no well for i've never had anything about that before but in my own personal life you know my, my my parents separated when they were um when I was seven, so like years and years ago, um, and my my dad had custody of us three kids, um, and I remember like he he's openly like admitted to me that he wouldn't have been able to cope if we, we had been taken by my mum. Like he wouldn't have been able to cope at all. So I imagine that goes on a lot. And again, like it's very rare. Although we do very well to unpick why people are upset men aren't great at sometimes explaining and 
a lot of the time they might be like, oh, I can't stop drinking. I'm drinking so much. But okay, why are you drinking? Oh, I'm just like, you know, I'm not doing any good. I'm not with my not with my missus anymore. Are they are they going to give me that information? You know, and 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 you know, there's the other thing is pride. It's like if I tell you this, are you going to think I'm a shit dad? Are you going to think I'm you know? So most people are open and vulnerable when we talk to them, but. I imagine men in particular are a little bit more reserved about what they say. Yeah, no one likes to sound like a dickhead, do they? Even if you are in a bad place or whatever, you, you still, even if you were talking to a stranger or someone, you still, in the back of your head, you don't want to say those words out loud sometimes. Yeah, I, I find that, you know, whether it's in business or, or in personal life, I think to allow yourself to feel, feel vulnerable, you've got to be quite confident and you've got to be in quite a good place to allow yourself to appear vulnerable. So I think if you are vulnerable, often you're not going to allow yourself to appear vulnerable, are you? And where, where does confidence come from? So that's like, so this is a massive, like, I'm, I, you know, at work, one of the things that I've been working on massively with, with Dan, you know, Danny, um, is psychological safety. And what, the first time I heard that, my reaction was, roll my eyes, that sounds like bollocks, right? But that's a hard skill. Like, psychological is a hard skill. Because if I want people to be at the fucking best, right, and, and, and like really push themselves, then they need to be safe in the knowledge that if they make a mistake, right, or if they're going to tell me something that's, that's, that, that's like upsetting them or anything like that and it's not going to be used against them, that's the only way they're going to grow. That's the only way they're going to get better. But, you know, it's like jiu-jitsu, man. Like, I'm not going to rock out. If I, if I got tapped out and I went, fuck this, I'm not doing that again, and I left, you're never going to get better at jiu-jitsu. Like you, need to, you need to accept the fact that you're not good. And the, the environment, need, if I got tapped out and everyone started laughing at me and going, oh, you're shit, mate. You're, you're terrible yeah. at jiu-jitsu. Never going back. I'd never go back, right? So there's a massive thing. Confidence comes from the people you've got around you as well. And, and some of the people, callers we get from some parents haven't got anyone to give them that confidence. How would you give them that confidence though? It, it must be a very hard skill to be able to, Calm, try and calm someone down and try and see their own reasoning without giving them any sort of direction yeah well that must be so hard it's, 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 the, it's the art of the questioning mm. and it's open questions are they are they set questions no. that you ask or is it just how you're feeling the conversations going so you can access and this is a really good point to make actually because it's, it's changed my life in terms of what I've learned from, from in terms of communication mm. but you can access um, this online it's called the Samaritans Listening Wheel and at the center of the, and it's just like a framework, right? It's, just, it's a big circle. And at the center, you've got si the word silence. And then all the way around, you've got like open questions. There's these little prompts to give you to say, right, this, these are really effective ways of, of letting people know that you're listening to them or actually physically listening to them. So if I ask you an open question, you have to give me an answer. Uh, this, and, and, and if I ask you a closed question, I'm going to get a yes or a no, or I'm going to get a word by not, one word answer. So if I can get you talking by asking an open question, you have to think about what you're going to say. It's not just an instant reaction. So that's one way we can get people to start thinking. The other things is words of encouragement, like, yeah, I'm listening, that sort of thing. Um, silence is massive. You know, if, if we sat in silence for a bit, eventually you'd want to say something just out of awkwardness. But that, then you start thinking, what do, I, what do I say? What do I need to say? And then, you know, I do that a lot on calls. Like if someone rings and says like, you know, I'm really struggling with it. I'm like, oh, what are you struggling with? He goes, I don't really know, really. And then you just sit in it, sit on it for a bit. And just like wait. You just sit there and wait and yeah, just listen. Yeah, I just wait. Just and wait it, for them. And it, you know, the worst that will happen is go, why aren't you talking? <laughs> and then I'll yeah. go, I was waiting, I was giving you a bit of space just to think about what you want to say. But like, yeah, if you just sit and wait and listen to them, they'll mm -hmm. go, I guess, you know, my problem is, and then they're off. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So that's... Yeah, power of silence. That's, isn't it? that's how you can influence people to start talking and thinking. And these, these are, I'm a salesperson, right? So that's, that's my job. And these tools are so good. And it's not about manipulating people, but it's just getting, if I, for me to effectively help someone in my job, I need to understand what they need. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can get them to understand what they, what they need is if you get them to reflect on that and tell you from them, themselves. And then if you mirror them and reflect that back and go, so you're saying this, you've understood what I've said. I like you. Do, do you know what I mean? It's so powerful once you know those skills. I find it crazy though that silence creates that natural thing of awkwardness. Yeah. Why? Why does that create awkwardness? Why does it? In you do, don't you? If we sat here now and just went quiet, 
you'd, you'd want to say something to break the silence, but there's, is it such a bad thing that silence is there? But it's, no, it's, it's not. And it's like an instinct that you can't yeah, explain. And there's like, a lot of stuff with what we do and it being a man or a woman or whatever, it's just instinctually there. Yeah, I don't know where it comes from because this is typically why people um and ah. This is sometimes why people leave with questions because they'll ask a question, don't get an immediate answer, then for they need to fill that gap. But yeah, I don't know. I wanted to ask you actually about what the impact of, of doing this was, both the, the, the positives and the negatives. So it sounds like you learned a lot. What are the other positives and, and are there any negatives from doing it, would you say? So that, yeah, so the positives are obviously self-explanatory. Like we, we spoke, no, no act is a selfless act. I, I, I think that in terms of, it's a really good, you feel amazing for doing it sometimes. Like, especially if you had a good shift and a good shift sounds terrible a good shift is when you've really spoken to someone that's going through it and they come away and they're feeling better you get a buzz out of it so you obviously that, that's a really good thing that, that what you learn I feel like I'm just becoming a better communicator um, you, you speak to so many diverse people um, I've learned a lot about mental health and mental illnesses things I didn't know about what's schizophrenia that sort of thing um, um, so yeah there's, there's, there's like endless 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 positives you meet some really cool people just that you're like working with. Um, and then, yeah, the negatives are like, you know, you've got to be, you've got to leave your issues at the door and then and then be on, on the phone and talking to people that are in a really bad state. That can be tough sometimes. And you've also got to drop your biases. So here's one for you. This will, this will probably get your blood boiling. But, you know, there, there's a chance that we could be talking to a paedophile telling us you know i've been i've been doing things with children uh, and i'm really worried and anxious because people are going to start to find out and you're there to support that person that's so, how to chop his fucking dick off mate. yeah <laughs> and, <laughs> so i can be a samaritan no, no, let, let me tell you like obviously that is yeah that's the, like, the automatic yeah, response of course it is, and, yeah. and, and 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 i guess this is in a way spins into a positive you learn so much objectivity and like restraint and just like you have to you have to pit your you become diverse in thought you have to put your mind somewhere else so it's almost like can i find any way of 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 understanding this person's viewpoint now i don't understand what he's doing it's disgusting right but can i understand why he might be anxious this goes back to cognitive empathy right can i understand why he might be scared that he's about to be found out and, and bad things are going to happen to him you can almost you can almost understand it so that's really tough like having those conversations they're really difficult but you have to you have to it's it's a it's, it's not like a it's a rule in, in so much that like it's the only way you can survive the Samaritans is you have to leave all your biases and all of your all of your opinions and all of your thoughts whichever way you think um at the door and that can happen with other things like someone could be speaking to you that are complete that have political views that are completely not your own you can have some people talk to you about things they're seeing that in your you don't think is reality, but they think is reality. So then you have to go, right, okay, that's where I am right now. This is this person's reality. Let's talk about that. When you say that, do you mean in regard, is that in regards to like mental illness? Yeah, they, well, it's hard to tell sometimes. Because you, you touched a moment ago on some, one of the things you've learned is around sort of different diagnosed complex mental health conditions. And it's almost like potentially two things, isn't it? Because you've got, you know, the, you've got the, I guess, people that are sound of mind, but they, they're, they're sort of got low moods, they, they've got no purpose yeah. or whatever, and, and, and they're one camp. And then you've got this other camp who have these really severe conditions like schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, bipolar. What's your thoughts on like the, the difference? It, it's, it's, it's a different conversation. Like um, some people have really lucid hallucinations so that they, they're seeing things and they're describing it to you now this was my biggest challenge um joining samaritans and this is probably where i've done the most growth since since joining is feeling comfortable talking to people that are like so like out there with or like they're, they're, they're really mentally ill um because you know in my life i probably naturally would have avoided those people if i'm honest if you see someone t sat there talking to themselves, you probably, you know, steer clear, give them a wide berth. But you, you're in a position where I'm talking to this person now. They're telling me they can see like cartoon characters coming out of their TV and things like that. Um, I'm going to have to sit with this and, and listen. So that's really difficult. Um, bipolar is another one like where 
and I don't I don't know how quick the switches are, but I've, I've experienced it where someone's just gone you know nuts on the phone, like just gone apps, just gone crazy at me, screaming at me. We get some calls that are hoaxes. They're the hardest. Mm. Like they're the hardest. Hoaxes. Yeah. So where people will ring up and pretend to be like um, someone has been raped um, and you're talking to them for like half an hour and then they start laughing in your face and say, and it's like someone in prison um, just having a laugh and like they've taken you down this road and you've got to sit there and go, this line isn't for all that. Like, if you do have any problems, give us a call. <laughs> uh, or you try and support them and go, well, is there any reason why you felt like you needed yeah. to do that? I was about to say, yeah, like, like, they, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, they, they, they probably just, need fucking help. The grown yeah, they do. <laughs> and you know, there's stories of people that have turned those around, like people that have rang up and hoaxed and then they've turned around and go, actually, I'm feeling a bit shit about myself. And then they've gone down that and they're really <laughs> successful calls. But like, you know, sometimes you just want to climb down the phone and batter them, but you can't. Like, it's, it's, it's the way it is. But I never ever thought of that. Yeah, but I mean, I never ever thought of that. It happens, and you know, like sometimes it's just kids pissing around. You remember when we were younger and you go into a phone box and you like call random free numbers and shit? Yeah. Well, I just called the sex line. Yeah, remember that? <laughs> yeah. I was like 13, called the sex line. I used to just fucking make sex noises and put it down. Yeah, we used to find <laughs> the fire engine so we could uh, so we could egg it. That was uh, that was probably not very wise thing. Did about. you? Yeah. Oh, I never went that far. Well, mate. we didn't, <laughs> didn't have social media, did we? Um, yeah. So I remember like. What we used to we used to have like a, a house across the road from a phone box and we'd ring we'd ring the phone box and just watch people go in and like give them <laughs> shit. But like when you get older, like you, you do get more empathy or you get like a better understanding. So I don't mind the kids too much. Like the kids is kind of like you, you're learning how not to be a dickhead. That's that's essentially the job, isn't it? Like how, learn how to integrate with society as you grow older. But it's the it's the ones that like you're like you should you're old enough to know better. Yeah, you're a grown man. Yeah. Man, you've just made me think of something there that you said because it's not something we've mentioned, but you do do you get kids calling in. Yeah, it's tough. Um, so, so anyone that calls in that's under eighteen, it's a safeguarding issue. Okay. Because we would deem them. So, it's, it's safeguarding issues usually come in two forms. They're they're someone that is, or three forms. So, it's someone that is um, imminently in danger. So, danger is happening to them now. Um, from themselves or from someone else? From someone else. Okay. Um, from themselves as well, but if they. Again, self-determination. If they decide they want that to happen, then that's fine. Um, the the other one is adults that can't make decisions for themselves. So if we, if we deem them as someone that is, hasn't got the capacity to make decisions, then that's a safeguarding issue. Um, and anyone under the age of 18, we deem as, as people that shouldn't really be making decisions for themselves. So they would be safeguarding concerns. But it's important to note, again, we don't know who they are. Mm. Like they have full, like they're, they're fully anon- anonymous. Um, and unless they give us their information, we, we won't be able to help them. So if you are a child and you want to call into Samaritan, so you can do anom- like, as, as an anonymous person, you can share whatever you want, but unless you give us your information, we can't do anything. God, and that's important. so horrible. Is, yeah, is that normally, would you, would you be obliged to ask for their information in that situation? Yeah. yeah. So I'd say something like along the lines of, you know, like what you've told me is really troubling me, you know, I'm quite concerned about your, your safety. Um, I'd love to be able to get you some help, but to do that, I'd need to take some information if you're comfortable sharing. And then if they're comfortable sharing and they want help, then we, we can we can put that in place. And you said at the beginning of the conversation in relation to the training as well, that one of the competencies for signing somebody off their probation is the ability to signpost. Yeah. Where would you typically signpost people to? So we have a pre-approved list of organisations. So we'd, we'd only ever signpost off of those. And then we have two different lists. We have a list for prisoners because they've got a different set of tools available for them or organisations available for them. Um, and then we've got another. So there's things like citizens' advice, charities that help with addiction, charities that help with veterans, um, domestic abuse, uh, mental illness, uh, like, like charities like Mind and that sort of thing. Um, so you'd signpost them to there. So it wouldn't typically be into the NHS, it's into charities. That's yeah, cool. so it wouldn't be into the NHS. The, the, you know, we, we might we might say, have you tried speaking to a doctor about this? Or do, like, how do you feel about speaking to a professional? But yeah, we, we're not there to give a medical advice anyway. Like we're, we're there. And, and when we signpost people, it's not like we're done with you now, fuck off. It's, it's kind of, you can you can use this charity alongside us. Like if you, we're here to listen, but what we can't do is give you practical advice on what you need to do. Because we're not professionals, we don't, you know, we're not, we're not qualified to help you. Um, but what we are qualified to, or, or what we are trained to do, is help you unpack your thoughts and be there for you if you need us. 
Yeah. And mate, we, we, we touched on it again at the beginning very briefly, but we, we've not actually asked. So I'm curious. It's obviously amazing work that you do and obviously you've learned a lot, but it, it takes a lot of your time. And, you know, what was the motivation for you doing this in the first place? So I remember it really clearly because I, I was, it was, it was during the pandemic and I was having like a bit of a, a crisis of identity at that point. Cause I was like, my job is, it's pretty fucking pointless. Like, cause it, we realized that you know, my sister worked in a supermarket and she was stressed. And so did my mum at the time, I think. And you know, they were stressed out. Like, we, we've got to be there. People need food. Do you, do you know what mm. I mean? And, and you know, like paramedics and everything. And I, I was just there. My office job was like cushy in my room. It's like selling training. And I thought, there's, you know, I, it, was, it was like a purpose thing as well. And I started to feel a little bit low and a little bit like um, depressed. And, and I think it was the, it was the purpose thing. And, 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 and that was when I was like, well, I need to go off and do something else. So I said to my boss, it was Damien at the time. I said to Damien, I was like, oh, I'm thinking about leaving. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do a different job. Um, I was looking into all sorts. And he said, it was him to me. So he said, do you want a different job? Or do you just want to do, you want to do something that's going to make you feel like you're contributing? So when you're looking to volunteering, so I started looking around and Samaritans, you know, it was a massively known, a well-known um, organization. I quite liked the idea of like speaking to people about their like emotional problems and stuff. And, and you know, like, communications quite, like, was, a, was a cool subject anyway. So I got in touch and, and that's when I started doing it. And, and it, 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 you know, it scratched the itch because I was kind of like, well, I, I do feel like I'm, I'm helping now. And I feel well, way better in my own job now. Like, I've found more purpose in my own job and I don't know whether that's a result of doing this but it might have just been where I lifted my mood a bit and so again self selfishly it was for that it, and, and, and no point this sound, sounds really bad but no point was I thinking I want to go out and affect individuals lives I just wanted to know that I was I wasn't sat there moaning about things I was just out there doing something for someone do, do you know what I mean and, and doing my bit um, and I think that's really important to people so yeah, if 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 if, if some people are looking to, to for purpose and volunteering is a really good way of doing that, of throwing yourself into that. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is, mate. And then just to close out, mate, I guess I don't know if what you would say to people is the right question, but if somebody's watching this and they're maybe struggling a little bit emotionally and mentally and are having sort of negative thoughts, like what what questions would you maybe pose them to think about? Okay, so yeah. The, the the first thing is and they're having negative thoughts. The first thing is, like, who do I have around me? Like, who can I confide in? Who's the first one I can speak to? Um, I'd ask. I'd probably ask like, have I got a full grip or full understanding of what my issue is or why I feel this way? Because um, if you don't, the first thing you need to do is go and find out. Um, and I would really encourage that person to go and try new things. You know, like and and, and get involved. Because if we, if we take the principle of what we said before, exercise, nutrition, sleep, um, and relationships with people, like meeting people and knowing yourself. There's a whole host of things you can do just within that, that the parameters of those things that are going to make you feel way better. Um, one of the, I, 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 you know, I always like the idea of getting into jiu-jitsu because, because of you, um, because you've been banging on about it for the last 10 years or whatever. <laughs> um, and, you know, I sort of, so I've always had that sort of interest and I've like watched videos and stuff and I was kind of like, well, I'm just going to do it because at the time I was, I was going through a really low moment myself and I was like, I need to do something. I need to get out and I need to find a group of people and like meet new friends and like, you know, I had mates, but I just, I just wanted to do something else. Um, and I also wanted to do something that was going to challenge me. Like, cause I'm not saying my life's a piece of piss, but like, jiu-jitsu ju you'll never ever complete jiu-jitsu it's not like super mario you're not going to go oh, i'll beat the boss i'm done now i've got my black belt see you later it's like you'll, you'll constantly always be shit at it in a way like you, you'll because you'll find someone like a bigger fish that will just batter you and um that that attracted me to it and and i think that helped me get out of a bit of a funk was knowing that i'm just going to be focusing on something that i can get better and better and better at um you're always going to have something to work towards so that's something I'd encourage them to do as well. It's just find find something where you can focus, um, and also call the Samaritans. You know, like if, if you're really if you're really low, like just you've got no one else to speak to. That's one of the questions we all always ask: is you know who in your who, who's in your network? Who do you trust? Who can you speak to? And so and a lot of them say no one. So that's what they call. Yeah, perfect. Well, we'll make sure we put the uh, the number probably down below in the description. We'll, we'll put it in throughout as well. But mate, that's been really interesting. Thank you so much for coming on. Cheers, no mate. Thank you. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.